We got it. It's here. We finally have a good way to auto scale our clusters, or at least some of us do. Before we proceed, let me give you a quick introduction of Kubernetes cluster autoscaling, the problems we have with the current solution and what we should have. And after that, I will show you Carpenter as a potential solution for the problems that we are facing. Imagine we have a Kubernetes cluster with only one worker node. And then we say, hey, here's the pod, run it. Kubernetes will check whether it can run that pod. And if it can, it will say, okay, I'm going to run it. And then we take another pod, give it to Kubernetes and say, run that one as well. Kubernetes will check whether it has available resources, mainly CPU and memory. And if there are available resources, it will run that pod as well. And then we repeat the process with the third pod and say, hey, run this one as well. And Kubernetes will do the same dance again. It will compare the required resources of that pod with the available resources in the cluster. And it might say, no, I am not going to run this because I cannot run it. There is no available capacity. And from that moment on, that pod will be in the pending status. Kubernetes will wait until something changes. Either one of the existing pods that are running in a cluster will be shut down and then there will be enough available capacity and Kubernetes will be able to run the pod that was in the pending state until that moment. But we can do better than that. We can scale our cluster by adding a second node, a second worker node. We can do that manually, but that's... Ah. Why would anybody want to do that? Because we have a better solution and that better solution is called Cluster Autoscaler. If you install Cluster Autoscaler or if you use one of the managed Kubernetes offerings that already have Cluster Autoscaler baked in, Kubernetes cluster will be expanding and contracting. Whenever it doesn't have available capacity to run the workloads that we want it to run, it will create new nodes. Similarly, if nodes are underutilized, then it will scale it down, it will remove one or more nodes. And if I go back to the previous scenario, you know that pending pod that cannot run anywhere because there is no available capacity. With Cluster Autoscaler, Kubernetes would create a second node. That node would be the same size as the first one. That would be the same. And effectively, in this simplified scenario, the capacity would double. We had one node with whatever is the amount of memory and CPU, and now we would have two nodes. And then we continue adding workloads or pods to our cluster. The fourth pod goes there. Kubernetes says, yes, I can run it. I have available capacity. Then we give it fifth pod and Kubernetes either runs it or it doesn't. If it doesn't have available capacity, it will not be able to run that pod, but cluster autoscaler would create a third node. And then once that node is available, once it's operational, it would run the pods over there as well and so on and so forth. And that works somehow, but there are a couple of problems with that. First of all, most implementations of the cluster autoscaler are creating new nodes that are the same capacity as the old nodes. And that means that when cluster scales up, the new nodes are either underutilized or overutilized. We might get a new node with 10 gigs of RAM because one pod couldn't be scheduled on the existing nodes, but if that pod requires only one gigabyte of RAM, then we have nine gigabytes that are not used at all. Or even worse situation is if we tell Kubernetes to run a pod that needs more memory or more CPU than the actual node can handle. Realistically, in that scenario, we would need a bigger node to be created and not the same node as the other nodes that we have in our cluster. So in most situations, we have no control over the size of the nodes that will be created with the cluster autoscaler. And it goes beyond that. We have no control of the zones, for example, where that node will be created. Cluster autoscaler is normally not aware of those things. It doesn't know that we might need it in this zone instead of that zone. And it might not be aware that that specific workload needs this disk that is available only here and not there and so on and so forth. There might be many requirements of an application that should influence how and where and under which conditions the nodes are created when the cluster expands. So let's say that I have a big pod, a huge pod, and I tell Kubernetes, run this. And Kubernetes says, no, it 
doesn't fit in this node. And if I create a new node, a new server, it will not fit there either because what you want me to run is bigger than the capacity of any single node. What should happen in that case is that Kubernetes should create a big node, a huge node, so that the workload that I need to run can fit there and vice versa. If I need something tiny, 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 Kubernetes should be intelligent enough to say, hey, for this tiny thing that you want to run, I can give you a small node, a tiny node as well, so that it fits perfectly for the workload that you want to run. It would be ideal if Cluster Autoscaler would be more intelligent than it is, and if that intelligence is combined with hints. We could give it hints like, hey, for this thing, maybe this is better than that. So we should be able to combine instructions provided by us together with uh, some intelligence, not some high intelligence, but still sufficient intelligence so the Cluster Autoscaler can figure out what to do and to do that well. And that's where Carpenter kicks in. It's an open source project started by AWS. And we're going to talk about the implications of that fact, the fact that AWS created that project, but we're going to do that later. For now, we're going to jump into the demo and I will start by showing you how we can set up Carpenter. The first thing we need to do is to create a cluster itself. I will not show you how to do that. I'm pretty sure that you can create a cluster. I already have mine up and running, so I will not show you how to do that. But if you do want to follow along, the link to the gist with all the commands that will allow you to reproduce what I did before I started recording this video, as well as what I'm doing right now, is available. So go and check out the gist if you want to reproduce what I'm doing. Now, there is one important thing to note. My instructions work only with AWS and work only if you create a cluster with DKS Cuttle. The reason for choosing AWS is because Carpenter is currently supported only and exclusively in AWS. That will hopefully change soon. So by the time you watch this video, Carpenter might have expanded the number of providers it supports. But right now, in December 2021, early December 2021, Carpenter supports only AWS. So keep that in mind and double check the documentation whether that's still true or not. With my cluster up and running, the first thing I need to do is get subnet IDs. And then I will use those IDs to add additional tags to those subnets so that Carpenter knows what is my cluster, what is the name of my cluster. Next, I will download CloudFormation definitions that will enable me to create Carpenter node instance profile and node role and controller policy. Those things are required. I will not go into details. I want to go through the setup fast so that I show you Carpenter in action. That's so much more fun than the setup itself. So let's move on. Then I will deploy the CloudFormation manifest. I will retrieve my account ID. I will create identity mappings. I will create a service account. And finally, 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 I will create a service linked role. Now this part was tedious, but if you're using AWS, you're used to it. There are many moving pieces and I will talk about those later, about the setup itself. For now, let's go into the fun part. Let's install Carpenter itself because all we did so far was preparation for the big thing. And the big thing is to install Carpenter. From now on, I promise, things will be easy. It's going to be smooth sailing from here on. Now that setup is finished, before we install Carpenter and configure it, I'm going to deploy an application and hope for the best, because that's what we do in software industry, right? We do things and hope for the best. Don't, don't do that ever. Before I proceed, I want to prove that I'm not cheating. I don't want you to call me a cheater. And I will do that by showing you the nodes of my cluster. I have only one node. And trust me when I say that my application will need more than one. Now, speaking of the application, it's a simple one. It's a Kubernetes deployment. There is nothing special about it, except to say that I want to run five replicas of my application and each of the containers need one CPU and one gigabyte of memory. Actually, the only thing that is weird or special is that I have the node selector that says that the pods of that application should run in US East. 
1A zone. Now this cluster is regional and the pods can be in any of the nodes of that region, but for this specific application the requirement is that it should run in the zone A. So let me apply that manifest by executing kubectl apply dash dash file name, the path to the file, and then I'm going to retrieve the pods from the default namespace, that's where I created the deployment, and I will get the nodes as well. Look at that output. All five pods, all five replicas of my application have the status pending. None of them are running. And if I would describe any of those pods, I would see the event saying, hey, I cannot run this pod because there is no place for me where I could run it. So my cluster with a single node right now cannot accommodate even one of those pods, especially not five. That's a bit of a problem. And since I have no intention to go and manually scale my cluster, I will install Carpenter, which will do the work for me. Unlike preparation, which is tedious, installation of Carpenter is very easy. It's very straightforward. I'm going to use Helm, even though that's not the only way we can install Carpenter. So I will need to add the repository where Carpenter charts reside. I will update my local copy of the repositories. And then I'm going to execute Helm upgrade, dash dash install, just in case it's not already running over there. And it's going to be Carpenter. And I'm going to run it in the namespace Carpenter. And I want to create the namespace. And I do not want Carpenter to create a service account. The version is 050. I will feed it the name of the cluster and the endpoint. And finally, I will wait. Now let's take a look at what we got by outputting all the resources in the Carpenter namespace. We have two services and two deployments, and those deployments created replica sets and replica sets created pods. It's boring, but that raises a question. Should the cluster autoscaler run in worker nodes or it should run in the control plane nodes? I say that it would be much better for many different reasons. If it would run in control plane nodes, but I cannot do that, I cannot run it over there because EKS does not allow me to access control plane. And there is a solution for that, but it doesn't depend on me and I will comment on it later. For now, let's jump into creating provisioners. Provisioner is a new custom resource definition that was created when I installed Carpenter and Provisioner gives us means to instruct Carpenter what to do under certain conditions. We can have one provisioner or two provisioners or five or a thousand. We can have as many provisioners as there are variations in a way how we want to scale our cluster. I will create only one because that's all I need to show you how it all works. But you should remember that you can have more. And in most cases, you will need more than one once you figure out what it really does and how useful it is. The action is happening in the spec of that manifest. To begin with, we have labels with only one label that says team should be a team. Labels can be anything you want and they do not really affect how scaling works, but they're very helpful if you want to figure out, hey, who created this node? It could be this provisioner or some other provisioner or maybe no provisioner. So that label will be added to new nodes once Carpenter starts creating them. Then we have requirements through which we can give additional instructions to Carpenter what to do and when to do something and things like that. In this case, I have three, except that one of them is commented because I do not really want to use that one, but I want to show you that you could use it. So let's start with that one. It says node.kubernetes.io slash instance type. That is called well-known annotations. Those are the annotations prescribed by Kubernetes itself. Those are not specific to Carpenter. Those are well-known annotations that we can use with different applications. And in this case, that application is Carpenter. So we are instructing Carpenter to use specific instance types, which can be T2 small or T2 large or T2 extra large or T2 double extra large. Specifying instance types can be useful if you want to be very specific what are the instance types that Carpenter should use to scale our cluster. But in most cases, there is no need to specify that because if we don't, Carpenter will try to figure out 
what is the best instance type it should use. Further on, there is Zone, which is yet another well-known label, the one accepted by Kubernetes community, that says, hey, it can be US East 1A and 1B and 1C. You can create nodes in any of those zones, and if there are other zones in this region, then don't do it. You must use one of those three zones. And if you remember the definition of the deployment that I used, that definition says, no, 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 I do not want to run in any of those zones. I want to run in 1A. And finally, there is carpenter.sh capacity type. Now, this is not a well-known annotation. This is not something prescribed by Kubernetes. This is an additional annotation, one of many, supported by Carpenter. And that one says, hey, use spot instances. I am cheap, so I do not want to spend much money on my nodes, so I'm going to use spot instances because they are much cheaper than normal instances. Next, we have limits, which in this case mean, hey, you are allowed to create new nodes when needed, but only the required capacity, in this case CPU, of all the pending nodes, of all those that couldn't be scheduled, is below that number. And finally, we have the provider section with one tag that says team is a team, and that's the tag that will be added to the resources, to the real resources, to the VM created by Carpenter. There is also instance profile, which is boring to explain, so I will skip it. And then we're coming to TTL seconds after empty set to 30. That's the grace period for scaling down. So if a node created by Carpenter is empty for 30 seconds, Carpenter will shut it down. It will scale down the cluster by removing that node. Let me apply that provisioner and take another look at what's happening with my pods and with the nodes. Pods are still pending. There is still no place for Kubernetes to run those pods, but there is a new node. Actually, there isn't a new node, but there will be a new node. Carpenter already figured out that the capacity is insufficient, that it should create a new node, that it should scale up the cluster, and that node is being created while I speak. And the reason why node creation started almost immediately is because Carpenter does not use node group. Cluster autoscalers in general, and specifically for AWS, are modifying node groups or whatever the equivalent of node groups is called in each of the providers. And that's slow because you change the desired capacity of the node group and eventually the system figures out that they should have new nodes and so on and so forth. That's slow and Carpenter knows that that way of handling the changes of the capacity is not fast enough. So it opted for groupless node provisioning, meaning that Carpenter is directly creating new nodes. It is not modifying node groups or doing any of those things. It is creating a new VM, a new EC2 instance, and it started doing it right away. As a result, the cluster should scale up much faster. Apart from speed, there is another reason why it is not using node groups, but I will explain that later if I remember to explain it. Let me fast forward half a minute approximately and see what we'll get. So kubectl will get pods and nodes and look at that. Now we have two nodes and both of them are ready. And Kubernetes already started creating containers. And that is also happening faster than it normally would because those pods were already pre-assigned to the node even before the node was created. So let me output the pods and the nodes one more time, and there we go. The pods are running and there are two nodes in the cluster. Amazing, right? Now let's take a look at Carpenter logs and see whether we can figure out what's going on from there. We can see that it batched five pods and then it tried to figure out which instance type would fit those five pods. And we can see from the list that it considered quite a few instance types over there. And then it started creating a new instance and it chose T3A2X large in US East 1A. So it figured out that for those five pods, the best instance type to use would be that one. And it chose to run it in zone A because if you remember from before, that is the requirement in the deployment itself. And it instructed Kubernetes to bound those five pods to that node, or to be more precise, to that node once it is operational and it is running and all the things that the node needs to have. And that's about it. Now it is waiting for the next round 
of unschedulable pods. So it figured out the correct instance type and it figured out in which specific zone it should create that VM. If we would have used Cluster Autoscaler instead of Carpenter, we would get a new node that is the same size of the existing node and that node could not run those five pods. Maybe, if we are lucky, it would be able to run one of those pods or maybe not even that one. In any case, Cluster Autoscaler would not create a VM specially tailored for those five pods and there would be one in three chances that that node would run in zone A because that region has three zones and Kubernetes with typical cluster autoscaler would choose randomly one of those three zones. The only thing left is to confirm that Carpenter can scale down, not only up, but down as well. And we can check that easily by deleting the application that I just deployed and then observing what will happen. So kubectl delete dash dash file name up yaml and let's take a look at the logs. We can see that almost immediately it added TTL or time to leave to the empty node. The node is empty but Carpenter is not deleting it or destroying it just yet. And it is not doing that because we specified in the provider manifest that it should wait for 30 seconds just in case before it removes the node. So let me fast forward 20 seconds or so and take another look at the logs. And now we see that it triggered termination after 30 seconds for that specific empty node, it cored on the node and then it deleted the node. And if you still do not believe me, I mean you should, but if you don't, we can take a look at the nodes and see whether that's really true. And indeed it is, there is only one node in my cluster. There were two nodes a few minutes ago and now there is only one, the initial node, the one that was never scaled with Carpenter. And now let's talk about Carpenter. Is it any good? Should you use it? Who should use it? When should we use it? Carpenter is potentially amazing. Kubernetes users need this badly because Cluster Autoscaler is very limiting. It will scale the nodes using the same instance type as the other nodes and it will do that across the region or the zone depending on what you choose. You have no control about instance types or the zones or many other parameters. It shows no signs of intelligence and so on and so forth. We can think of Cluster Autoscaler not as the final solution but as the base, as the blueprint, and now we have a really good solution. Or, to be more precise, some of us have a really, really, really good solution, while others do not, but I will get to that later when we get to cons, because right now we are going to start with pros. What are the good things about Carpenter? To begin with, I think it's brilliant that it can pick the right instance type automatically without us telling it anything, even though we can do that, but we do not have to. It will evaluate what is the current workload that is pending and choose the right node and then it will create that node, add it to the cluster and that's about it. That is so much better than what Cluster Autoscaler is doing, at least most of Cluster Autoscalers. The closest thing we have to Carpenter would be GKE Autopilot, which has some things that are absolutely amazing, others are not so much, I will not compare it in this video, but that is the implementation that is closest to Carpenter, except that GKE Autopilot works only in Google Cloud, GKE, but that could be set for Carpenter as well. Uh, I'll, I'll get to that later. The second amazing thing is flexibility. It can work with different instance types, with different zones, and with quite a few other different parameters. We can instruct it what to do, when to do it, how to do it. We can have multiple provisioners, and so on and so forth. It is very, very flexible, which is completely opposite from Cluster Autoscaler, which is completely inflexible. The third huge benefit is that it is groupless node provisioning. It is not modifying node groups, it is working directly with VMs and that speeds things up drastically. And on top of that, it bounds pods to the newly created, no, it bounds pods to the nodes before they are even created, so everything happens like this. Absolutely brilliant. To be more precise, that's absolutely brilliant if you compare Carpenter with Cluster Autoscaler in AWS, 
cluster autoscalers for other providers are already groupless, but that would be a separate story. And finally, we can have one or two or five or any number of provisioners. With cluster autoscaler, we need to configure it once. There is only one configuration. With Carpenter, we can have as many provisioners as we want. Carpenter will pick the provisioner that matches the requirements and do whatever it needs to do. Now let's go into cons. What are the things that are not so good? What are the things that I do not like? There are only a few, but those few might be a deal breaker. To begin with, setup is very complicated, or to be more precise, Carpenter setup is very easy, but the steps we need to execute before we install Carpenter, you know, the setup on AWS side is very tedious, but that should be attributed to AWS itself rather than Carpenter. That's the inherent complexity of managing things in AWS. So I will not use that as a negative point to Carpenter. So let me remove it from the list. A really, really important, potentially negative thing that might not be negative in the near future is that Carpenter works only and exclusively with EKS in AWS. We cannot use it in Google Cloud, we cannot use it on-prem, we cannot use it in Alibaba, in Azure, we have to use it in AWS with EKS. Now Carpenter itself is not designed to be EKS only, EKS is only the first implementation and the big question is whether the rest of the providers will adopt it and expand Carpenter to support those providers. And that's where I'm not really sure. I'm not convinced that Google, Azure, VMware, and other big players will actually contribute to Carpenter. So this might likely end up being AWS only, even though it was not designed to be AWS only. So I'm not sure. Time will tell. Now that negative thing applies to you only if you're not using EKS in AWS. If you're using EKS in AWS, then please, please, please use Carpenter. It is so much better than the alternatives that we have right now for EKS. And for the rest of the providers, well, time will tell.